Hi guys. Uh, so as you said, my name is Chris. Uh, I, I, I work for Esri, which is like a bad word at this conference, but um, I used to work for a company called GOIQ. And uh, a year ago we were acquired by Esri, and, and, but we still get to do all the same things we used to do. It's just that our now bosses are different. So, um, so I'm obviously not Andrew Turner. Does anyone know who Andrew Turner is or has ever seen Andrew Turner talk? Only Tim up there. Anybody else? All right, so a, a few of you know who Andrew is, and I w I've worked closely with Andrew for years, and um, so unfortunately he couldn't make it because he's um, traveling constantly, and, and this just didn't work out. So, um, so he asked me to give this talk, and uh, this, is, this is talk one of three that I have today, so it's sort of like the, the beginning of my marathon sprint. For the next three sessions, I'll be talking. Um, but at, at the same time, um, like rule number one for talks is, is like never go long. I hate when talks go long, but n rule number two is always like never apologize <laughs> before you give a talk. But, um, and I'm not going to apologize, but I did just get these slides today or yesterday from Andrew. Um, and he added copious amounts of notes, and that's why he was delayed in getting it to me. But I can't figure out how to actually pull up the notes, so I don't have them here. So it's going to be me kind of bumbling through this one a little bit in terms of like kind of reacting to the slides you see and then thinking about what Andrew would say, right? Um, so, and then also, n Andrew is super notorious for um, speaking really, really fast because he's got this, this big brain and he just thinks really quickly and can move th through things. And I've seen him give half hour long talks in five minutes. Right, just really, really fast, and, and, but he's a great guy. Um, and also then he, as you see down here in the bottom corner, uh, he's uh, re we're recycling this talk from the North American Phos4G. Um, he gave this uh, there. It's a different version than kind of what's in the program, but I think instead of canceling this talk, because Andrew couldn't make it, the things that he has in this slide deck are worth talking about, especially at this conference. And so I think um, like I was willing to step up and, and give the talk. And the things we have going on are, are super worth it. So um, I'll, I'll, with that, I'll start. So, so basically, Andrew, Andrew starts with um, a discussion about like buzzwords right? and th the cloud and what that means. And really, it just means that we've, we've now got this, this ability to handle um, a lot of distributed components and, and things going out to the cloud. But we're, we're constantly putting things out in the cloud because because storage now is, is super cheap, and we can, we can process it on demand. But it also means that we're constantly throwing data out to the cloud and kind of like putting it there for later, then analyzing it a little bit later, right? Stick in the database and then kind of react to it in time or um, build analyses that sort of react to what our data are telling us after the fact. Um, but big data is big. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, big data is big, as you can see. Um, it's, it's billions of features, right? And I'm, I'm a JavaScript developer. I work on the client side. I, I deal with visualization, things like that. Um, but big to me is a lot smaller, right? But big to the big data folks and the buzzwords are, are billions of features. It's the three Vs. It's variety, velocity, and volume, right? We have tons and tons of features coming at us. If you look at Twitter, it's also very, very fast, right? And for big events, sadly not this event, but big, big events on Twitter, coming in at rates of 10,000 per second, right? 10,000 features and events per second, which is insane if you try to think about how we adapt to, to handling that sort of volume of data. Um, but, but typically our analyses and things, our, our, our approach to processing data are always kind of go to the data. We put the data somewhere, we go to it, and we crawl through it. Um, but I think we want to stop moving the data necessarily, but, but move the algorithms to it, if that makes sense. So, so our, our algorithms to touch data and to feel it and mess around and dissect it and pull it apart are typically like bring the data to it and it processes. We have a web processing server that's sitting there waiting to be injected with data and buffered out this point and then we're going to return it. But instead, what we're talking about here in the cloud is we can start bringing our analysis to that data. Right? So we reverse our sort of paradigm there. Um, and so at Esri, we, we're, we're doing this thing. Uh, as soon as we started, we, we really started making a strong push for open source code. Um, one, because it's developer happiness. Um, it's what we want to be working on. We don't want to be working on proprietary data sets as a group, right? I mean, I don't think anyone as Esri is always like, I've, I wrote this code, I have to sell it. Um, but there's things going on at Esri that we want to share with the community as well. And um, this is not my work, so, so I don't know the depth about what GIS tools for Hadoop really goes into and how it works. But I know that it's awesome in terms of 
a big project that was written uh, within the last year and open sourced at Esri and, and with, with the um, intention of never, never selling this product, giving it to communities and making think about um, you know, how, how Esri starts building out software that is very community driven. So it's cool because it's really the first thing that is entirely born in the open source space at Esri and, um, and really kicks ass. And so it's a whole stack of, of tools for, um, for processing big data within Hadoop. And so the idea um, is that we, we dump a bunch of data in Hadoop and it, it this, this whole package the, of the GIS tools consists of diff uh, three different things. The geoprocessing tools, um, the, uh, the, the spatial framework for managing that data within, um, within Hadoop, which is really accessing it just via Hive, right? So it's like SQL on top of Hadoop. Um, and then also Hadoop itself and, and the uh, addition of the Esri Geometry API. And that, the very bottom piece here, that's the awesome work that, that really this talk is, is the only one to be talking about at, um, at FOS4G. The Esri Geometry Library, or Ingen, is the most open source Java geometry engine available. JTS, does anyone know what license JTS is? Right, JTS is the Java Topology Suite. It's good old LGPL, right? It's really, really close to GPL, which is the most toxic of licenses. But LGPL is not that bad. But this is Apache, right? So Apache is way more open than LGPL, which is JTS, which is like the mother of all Java engines, right? I mean, post GIS, everything takes its roots from JTS. This was released last year and, and, and was a huge deal. I'm not a Java developer at all. I, I can't stand it. I won't touch it. But this is a really big deal in that JTS now has an actual competitor, right? Before, in the open space, there was nothing. You had JTS, you had GEOS, right? Post-GIS, all that lineage right there forms from, from, uh, from, from JTS. As we had this in the works and, and we had to open source it just to make the Hadoop tools like this, this full open source stack, which is really cool. This is a huge shift within Esri that like we're willing to take something that was written actually before the open source sort of movement in Esri started um, and they're willing to sort of free it up and move it. Um, so, so within the geometry engine, there's, there's what you would expect, right? There's uh, support for simple features, you know, OGC simple features uh, specification. There's topological operations like cutting and difference and intersection. It's a full Java API for doing all this. Um, relational operations, right? We, we know what these are. These are sort of what we've been, been taught and, and spend our day with every day. Um, something that's really cool about our import-export is, um, well, oh, actually, I'll, I'll say two things. I mean, something that's really not cool is Esri has this really funny way of um, assuming everybody wants to conform to their formats and specifications, like shape files and things like that. But um, also in the JSON world, we have this thing called like Esri JSON, which is totally new to me when I, when I started working at Esri, that I just assumed everything was GeoJSON. How could you actually do anything without like just conforming to that. But alas, Esri has their own geo, uh, or their own form of a, of a geospatial JSON format. Um, and I think they call it like the REST JSON or something. But um, really we like GeoJSON. And uh, this line here with, with uh, from GeoJSON to GeoJSON is, uh, is an insertion that Andrew made in the slide deck this week in that um, since he gave this talk at the North American conference, uh, as a result of this talk, a guy named Scooter Wadsworth, who now is working on GeoGet at Boundless, um, actually pulled down the code and added to and from GeoJSON and made a pull request back, which is sweet, right? You see that sort of collaboration and, and um, that's what it's all about. I mean, just, just that alone allowed us to kind of go to the bosses editor and say, see, see, this is, this is what's awesome, is the community will do this with us. Um, so other operations, right, what you might expect, um, things that you would see inside PostGIS and, and QGIS and things like that, things that exist in, in GEOS. Um, so another cool part of this is Hive Spatial. Anyone know what Hive is? It's um, uh, really like, like just an SQL front end on top of HDFS, which is the distributed file system for Hadoop. Um, Hive is awesome if you're working with big data. So it looks just like this, just like what you would expect. Um, where you know we're, we're running a contains on a point, we're just really just a simple point and polygon <laughs> aggregation right there um, within Hive. And really what, what's cool about this is this is a single point of entry for then a massive store of data, if you think about distributed file systems. Um, so that's cool. 
but so what? I'm not sure what Andrew's talking about. Oh yeah, so um, there's, uh, so then, okay, so, so what, right? So we have these, these tools, what do we do? And, and uh, this is the only screenshot of ArcMap uh, that you'll see at this conference. Um, <laughs> and I actually don't even know how to work ArcMap. But um, the, uh, the cool thing is that we have all this data. Um, and I think these, these next few slides are around um, hits from RTS online. So we have this, this amount of massive analytics engines that, that you know, look at all requests and log it out. And those logs just generate tons and tons of data. And so we start looking at um, requests for imagery and see like what the hot zones are and where do we need to optimize and things like that. So um, just the ability to sort of like pull all these into ArcMap via these tools is, is uh, this work of this guy, Mansoor Rad, who's absolutely amazing um, with, with all this big data stuff. Um, something about the Dutch cadastral mapping here, uh, another, another data set from our logs. And then uh, similar data set requests, but right around like the same day as the Russian meteor. And so, um, you know, the Russian meteor came and, and you just get massive amounts of hits onto, you know, we make a map and then um, they pull it all down. It's really hard for the analysts to actually visualize and understand what's happening behind the scenes. Um, so then another one is uh, we got a bunch of data from uh, a Japanese um, car company and they wanted us to analyze it. And so it's sort of the same story that, that I sort of um, have already talked about, but 4 million vehicles, or 40 million vehicles, um, sort of aggregate them up into a, um, uh, a grid and then analyze the carpool locations and it, it runs in you know, a few minutes or something like that. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not really giving that justice. Andrew would be shooting me right now for that. Um, oh, that's very nice, Andrew. All right. Um, let's see the smoke. Sorry, this is fun. Wow, that's a style right there. Um, so another project that we, so, so, so this is shifting gears a little bit, right? And, and I think I started to allude to this in, in the very beginning about sort of bringing algorithms to data and data to algorithms and stuff like that. And, and so at Esri, we started a project called, Storm, uh, called uh, Anvil. And Anvil is a geospatial implementation on top of Twitter's Storm product. And Storm is <laughs> super, super kick-ass in that it's massively scalable, it's massively distributed, and it can handle I I amazing amounts of just streams of data, right? So it's what one might refer to as a complex event processor. So it just takes a stream of data, which are these taps over here, and it runs them through what they call bolts. And these bolts can then op do small manipulation on like a, a tuple of data or a triple of data, right? So we start opening up these taps, and, and what we can do then is go take that open source Java geometry library, inject it into these bolts, and start doing geo enrichment and geospatial aggregation against like sh things like shared indices, and, and start building out this massive streaming network of, um, of real-time processing. This is super awesome. We use it um, for a project called, um, oh. I didn't realize this was a video. Nice job. Um, he's a pretty good presenter. Um, so so we, we, we use it for a side project we have with um, some of the spook agencies in, in the US. And um, what it does is essentially enables us to allow streaming on the client. Right? So we go to Twitter. We have these feeds coming from Ginip, which is a provider of the fire hose of Twitter that we can sit there and just tap into. Right? So as soon as we we stand up a topology, is what they call them. It's just an, uh, not an actual spatial topology, but a topology of bolts and filters that we operate on within Storm. Uh, we stand one of those up for a Twitter search, and it, um, it goes in, taps into our Anvil instance, boots up that topology, and starts streaming data down. Here, there's no real spatial information being added to it. Um, but what we have is this other video I wanted to show. Um, Sorry, uh, wait, come out of presenter mode. Uh, so I'll, I'll boot this up in, uh, in full screen. So the idea is, is real-time social media analysis, right? And, and I think like, we've, we've kind of, I mean, personally been burnt out on, on like mapping tweets. <laughs> it's, it's really this boring thing that ultimately just shows you where population is. Um, but basically, like, we had this idea that um, we were tracking Twitter. And a, a lot of like, what we do is, is really just consume Twitter during these major events. And so this major event is Sandy, um, a hurricane that came into 
New York. And what you saw right there is we enter in Twitter, we, we enter in our parameters, and it starts just pointing dots. He's like, but that's not really that informative. And so what we want to do is a, a client-side aggregation of that data. Um, so, uh, so then we start saying, well, you know, what if we could just count what, what's happening at, at, um, you know, on the client, on the fly, as points stream in, start aggregating data. Um, that would be pretty sweet. And so, so when we looked at this and said, well, that's, that's awesome. Like, what else can we do? Um, and so just counts don't really provide that much. What we, what we wanted to do is start um, doing some more analytical processes on that data. And so um, we had this beautiful, this wonderful guy named Sean Gorman who's this PhD and can say things like location quotient and, um, and, and location quotient normalization and these, these really funky complex algorithms to look for certain events and, and anomalous activity within that stream of data. And so we started working on that and started applying those, um, those functions and algorithms to that stream of data. And what we can see is we start seeing areas of anomalous um, activity as soon as like, the major event sort of occurs. We get this big bubble up and things are happening. The first one we start to see is down here. It alerts us to, hey, something's going on. We just passed this threshold. And what happened was the explosion at the Con Edison plant in lower Manhattan happened. Um, this is the hurricane rolling through. All of Manhattan at this point is, is out of power. And what we see is a migration of tweets and information above, um, what is it, 104th or something, where Grand Central Station is, and all the people basically moved up to Grand Central Station and uh, where they had power, right? And so it's this really interesting insight to that one event and, and the whole stack of, um, of Granted, it's a canned response here where we, we're basically just canning and recycling that data feed, but it tells a nice story about the things that we can enable with this sort of um, power and algorithms. Uh, let me go back into here and see. I think that, that is pretty much the, uh, the end. Oh, he's got, I think, the, yeah, the same, the same uh, demo in video form. I should have looked at that in the presentation. So, um, yeah, all of this is available on GitHub. Um, it's, it's awesome to see Esri doing what they're doing in terms of, uh, we've had top-down directorship saying things that should be open, or things that can be opened, should, like, should all be open. And so we're just pouring, pouring everything into GitHub, and uh, it's been super awesome. So, thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Concerns? Thanks. Um, so, yeah. So, Say I was going to start with my approach experience processing. Um, are you eventually moving to deploy the service so that you're making sure that the safety is still present? You need a fairly big cluster to set them up, right? Definitely. I mean, uh, we just we run on AWS EC2 instances. Um, starting to look at more scalability within like using things like Docker IO. Um, we have internal, internal and external sort of like app clusters. The, the, that's kind of where we're going at, but I'm not a DevOps guy, so I'm not really like the best informed to, to be talking about that or with any intelligence. So, cool. And I'm, I'm talking twice more, um, not about this stuff, but about um, like JavaScript and stuff like that. So, that's it. <laughs>